you brilliant. In that there. case, uh, welcome everybody both in the room and online to um, today's CSIC research talk. And if I open this, I'll get my bio of Alice right. So we're, we're delighted to have Alice Chichirella that makes a <laughs> with us today. Alice is a relatively new um, academic in the department, but she, we're actually just welcoming her back because she did her PhD here. There's a seat here. She did her PhD here, oh, about two minutes ago. Um, <laughs> and, and your first postbox? Was here as well, isn't it? As well. Uh, yeah. But since then, she's had a glittering academic career um, in Oxford and Dove, uh, and we're delighted that she's come back to Cambridge to um, Division C. Perfect. Uh, which, for those of you who aren't au okay fait with those things, is the division that is sort of mechanics and materials and various other things. But actually, her interests lie very much at the heart of what we do in CSIC, which is a civil engineer by training, yay, um, and also has. Um, a lot of interest in how we use machine learning to interpret monitoring data and so on. So um, I'm not going to steal her thunder because she'll do a much better job of telling you what she does than I am. Uh, so over to you, Alison. Thank you so much for being willing to do the talk. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much for being here and present and online. So it's my delight to give this presentation. I chose a very long title, then I regret, but you cannot read it, so I don't have to go. Okay, so probably I should tell you more about the, the things that I'm interested in before starting talking about uh, the topic of the research. And what you see there are the type of structure that I'm interested in. And you can see that there is a quite broad range. And what they have in common is they are subject to problem logging and they are complex type of structure, when it's got different pieces. So what we do as engineers is that we build models. They can be very simple, like single degrees of freedom, or they can be more complex. And what we do is, of course, monitor the structure. But these are not the only type of information that we have. We actually collect information through report, through failure report or special reports. And what I'm interested in are actually having infringing in which challenge. The first one is what you see on the top left. There is actually the design stage. And recognizing the fact that we are dealing with a system that are complex subject to uncertainties and what I'm also interested in and what I'm talk about today is the monitoring and modeling for assessing the remaining useful life. And what I'm interested in particularly is, again, the problem of dealing with uncertainties, with non-linearity, and the fact that most of the time we have access to sparse and noisy data. And finally, if I want to use machine learning and make sense of it, I have to make sure that they are explainable and interpretable. So those are the three research challenges that I'm interested in. And to tackle those, so I set up the data regression and uncertainty group. There is my research group, and Jan is my PhD student based there, and I was embarrassed because I wanted it. And uh, what we do in this group is that we have an integrated approach. So we do experiments in the lab, we do signal processing and information extraction, we combine data with models and uh, uncertainties, and we actually quantify uncertainties. So it sounds like a lot, and yes, we do a lot, because uh, we truly believe that to tackle these challenges, we actually need a lot of that. And what we do specifically is developing techniques for predicting the performance, uh, developing techniques for assessing the status of a system, but also developing this technique for extracting the information. Okay, so I hope that this gives you a sort of vision about what we do in general. And uh, I'm gonna just give you a few pointers about some of the output that we recently, um, uh, actually, uh, that recently came out. The first one is about uh, information extraction from report. And we were looking at knowledge graph, how you can automatically generate those. We were looking at statistical model updating technique, and there are several techniques that are listed, but also uncertainty, propagation, and understanding better friction. Again, it sounds like it's broad and it's not connected, it's all connected. To solve those challenges, we need all of these elements. But now, let's go through the talk. So now that you understand all of this, you probably will understand better why it is so important to embed what we know from all these different sources with machine learning and with physics. So the talk is gonna be structured in these parts. I will start by telling you why we are actually talking about physics enhancing machine learning. And then I'm gonna talk about the main strategies and give you some example of how we tackle this problem. And then I will talk about challenges and opportunities. Now, I'm Italian, you already noticed that I move a lot, and uh, I can speak very, very fast, even faster than this. So, <laughs> if you need me to slow down, if you have a question, raise your hand, or even do it, it's necessary, and I'll stop. Okay, <laughs> super, let's start. So, 
what is the general purpose of machine learning? I assume many of you have heard of it or use it or using it at the moment. But the main purpose, if you think about it, is actually different from what we normally do as engineers. So in traditional programming, we say we have an input data, we have some information, we have an algorithm that can be a causal model, and then what we get out of it is actually as an output. And usually this output is a physical quantity. Okay, so personally, what's the catch? What is machine learning doing? Machine learning instead is taking the input and the output as input to actually the machine, to the computer. And what is giving us out of it is an algorithm. And this algorithm can solve different tasks. Okay? So this algorithm is very useful for doing classification, regression, for learning things from the data. But uh, we have to think about uh, when it is useful and when it might not. So it's very helpful in building specialized models and investigating the correlation and association. <laughs> but it's actually not very good at telling us about causal relationship. This is caused by this effect. It's actually by this force, by this thing. Now, the other challenge is that there is not immediately straightforward to distinguish different things that are contributing to the behavior, to the response. So imagine if you have a wind turbine and you have the wave, you have the wind, you have for instance, a big storm. Well, it's difficult to actually distinguish all of these elements acting on the structure if we are just looking at measurement and measuring maybe input at some points. Okay, so I hope that this already is helping. You can see people nodding, no one having a weird face. Thanks. So what else the tasks that are best solved by machine learning in general? So in general, it's very good at recognizing patterns. It's very good at recognizing anomalies if something goes wrong. It's very good at generating patterns, and everyone has heard about deep fake. And also, it's very good at making prediction. So we have an opportunity here, opportunity to use this, but actually embed our physical knowledge as well. So let's go on to monitoring, because I started then usually by telling you about machine learning, and only now I'm going back to monitoring. So when we look at structure, different type of structure, what we want to do is actually to track the behavior of the structure. And actually, we have some data. But then what we want to do is make inference. And this inference could be, is there a damage? Where is it? How, what is the extent? And in general, what we would like to do is build a digital tree. The main reason why we do that is actually this one, guiding decision making. This is actually very different from the general purpose machine learning. We are actually taking decisions that might say we have to close the bridge or we have to do maintenance. The effect of that decision can be very costly and can actually affect the lives of people as well. So it's very, very important that we always keep in mind that we are doing this for guiding decision making. And of course, if we think about how we can make inferences, all of that comes from the data. So let's talk about the data. So data is not enough. If someone tells you what you need is data, data is never enough. The reason why data is not enough is, is that data should mean information. If the data is not informative, you cannot use it. But we are actually doing some inherent assumption. Every time we say we have data, we have information, we are actually saying something. We are saying that uh, the data is informative, that is accurate, and it's reliable. Now, if this is the case, then we can use it. But now there is another problem that we have to face. Everything that we will build using machine learning will be actually dependent on the data that we have. And is it the right data is the first question. But the second question is that in civil engineering, mechanical engineering, engineering in general, will we be able to have all the labels? Will we be able to observe all the possible state of our structure? Most of the time, the answer is no. Then uh, would we be able to extract all the information that we need? Because we don't have just measurements. As I told you at the very beginning, we have reports. We might have pictures. We might have different sources. And these sources uh, of information might be collected at different frequency and spatial resolution. You might collect uh, different information all at the same time, but the resolution, the quality of them might be wildly different. And of course, uh, the big question is that, is the data up to date? Is the data that you're going to use actually representing the actual state of the structure? Because if it's too old, then, then the structure went through maintenance or different process. Maybe you should not use the data anymore. OK, so if I convince you of this already, that's very good. And I can see people smiling. Great results so far. So why do we need then physics? Why do we need to enhance machine learning? 
because data is not enough, as I'm telling you. And if we think about it uh, in terms of physics knowledge and data availability, and again, data that is informative, we can divide, we can think of having nine bridges here. So if we have lots of data, there is informative machine learning. Let's go for it. But if we have instead not enough data, but we have lots of physics knowledge, we will be more confident and comfortable in using actually physics model. Most of the time we are sitting actually in data areas. We know some physics, we have some data, and we want to make sense of it. Okay. So what's the problem? Getting into the corner of the, of the graph is very difficult because usually the volume of useful measurements that we have is not that large. And uh, if we want to generalize uh, and use this model that we're going to build to actually go and extrapolate in conditions that we haven't observed, having physics will help us. So every time we think about machine learning, we have to be careful. It's not just the data, but actually there are other two challenges that we have to keep in mind. The first one is the generalization performance, how we will get out of the training set, but also the possibility of get, getting a solution or results that are inconsistent or implausible. It's all based on data and there's no physics constraint. No one is stopping the algorithm to actually give you something that doesn't make sense. We can spot it and an engineer will never do that, a good engineer, but uh, you know, it will not be possible. So what's the reason why these things can happen? Again, we were saying that data is important, but data may be based on something that comes from corrupted or non-informative measurements. Sensor might fail, like my wearable might fail for some reason, and that's for, I mean, I'm still collecting data, but that's not a problem. The most important thing is the causal relationship and distinction of compounding sources. They are not there. So that's another big problem. So all of this was to tell you that machine learning is great, but can give us a very, very accurate, but completely wrong prediction. So what we want to do is constrain it with physics to move away from things that are implausible. Okay? So far so good? Yeah? Amazing. So what's the other point? Everything that I told you was that we want to actually take decision. So if we want to guide decision making, we have to use approaches that goes beyond these black boxes and they have to be interpretable and explainable. So what do I mean by that? So interpretability aspect, this question, how was a prediction made? And explainability is like, can I actually communicate to someone how I'm gonna support this decision? Okay, the key thing is that if we can interpret the model, we can understand what happened if the model fail or succeed, and we can go back and fix it. And uh, this is very important because uh, as human, we will trust something that is actually more interpreted. But what is the other important thing is actually when we talk about explaining some results, uh, the results do not need just to be comprehensible. They should communicate uncertainties. They should communicate the lack of knowledge or the fact that we are not 100% sure that the prediction is actually the value, but there is some uncertainty. And it's very important to identify their uncertainties and communicate that. And of course, uh, the main reason to do that is that the critical decision needs to be presented in a format that is understandable by humans, but also that carry the information about risk associated by taking that decision. Okay, so now I'm gonna try to explain to you more and more about uncertainties, and I'm building up this slide. And I'm using the, the fact that uh, when we try to incorporate physics and data, the whole goal is to build an algorithm that actually is creating a virtual replica of our structure. So let's say that we have a wind turbine and we want basically to have a, a time evolving digital model that can account for uncertainties and the system interaction, okay? So we're gonna have some input, the operational environmental logic, and we're gonna have some output of that. That's the true output. Now we're gonna measure it. Okay. Now what we do is that we're gonna build a model and we're gonna get an output because we give an input and we're gonna get an output from the model. Now what we can do is actually take those measurements and try to build something and learn from them. But we can also actually combine this model with uh, some of the data. What is interesting is that at every stage, the results are gonna be different. The why that you're measuring, the physical quantity that I said it was 
the acceleration of one point is going to be different. And it's going to be different even from this point, from Y true to Y measure, because you're measuring, but there's going to be noise in the sense. Okay? So every time, at every step, we are actually having an error. Okay? So now I'm going to remove the figures and I'm going to try to put some equation behind it, but very simple equation. So we go, we have the actual structure and we have a relationship path that we don't, we don't know. We have the true input, the true output. We take the sensor, we get a wide measurement. Now, between the measure and the true, we're going to have a measurement there. Makes sense. Cool. Now, we build an approximate model. This approximate model will have some parameters that we will not know, they might be uncertain. These parameters still up. And now we have an input model and we'll get an output model. Okay. What is happening then is that we're going to have a physics based modeling gap. Because the results that come from the model is going to be different from reality. We can also build a data driven model and we will have a data driven model together. We can also add the sensor and then combine it with physics in form and we'll have another error. All of these errors are things that we don't know, are approximations that we are making. And all of this will actually can be can be actually either due to lack of knowledge or actually there because they are varied, there are things that are changing. And we have to account for them and we have to model that. So it's very important to actually model these uncertainties, but also account for the fact that uh, our model prediction may be inconsistent with reality because of model discrepancy, of the fact that our model was not accurate enough, was not considering all the elements. Okay, so far so good, guys? Yes? Amazing. So what is this physics and how's machine learning? Because I've been telling you about machine learning, I've been telling you about what we need to do and which are the challenges in digital twins. Well, much to me, physics enhanced machine learning is an integration challenge. It's integrating all of these things and accounting for them. And this goes beyond just having the mathematical model and the data that might be heterogeneous or, or gappy or noisy. It's actually accounting for the fact that we have multi-fidelity data that are different spatial interpolar correlation and are different quality. But we have different level of information that come from prior knowledge. We also have the fact that we must ensure that we have interpretability and explainability, but account also for these uncertainties. And most importantly, we have to deal with this problem. We have to deal with corrupted data. We will have to deal with non-informative data and wrong physics data learning devices that we are introducing every time at every step. Okay, so that's a big challenge. It's not a grim situation. It means that there are lots of opportunity to develop exciting techniques. But now let's try to get better at why we want to use that, what we will get out of it if we actually integrate all of this. So if we were going to use machine learning strategy in SHM, which are great as well, and they help us a lot, what we will get is an algorithm to solve a specific task, for instance, outlier identification. This is great, but it might lead us to the two problems that I described earlier. Again, very accurate, but potentially wrong. You know? prediction. So what is physics and also machine learning for SHM giving us instead? So we have our machine and what we get out of it is an algorithm that solves a specific task, but now because we are constrained with physics and with information, it will help us extend the generalization and limit implausibility or inconsistent prediction. It helps us developing these digital twins that combine all of the information and evolve with time. And uh, it helps us also inform physics. What I mean by that is that if you're monitoring something, we can learn about, for instance, physics law that we don't know, didn't know before, how to characterize, like friction law. And I'll give you an example later. It also helps us identify wrong physics or data bias. And there are many other reasons to use that. But the main thing that is changing is that we don't have anymore just input and output. We have physics biases. And we actually embed those uncertainties. That's the key thing. OK. So this was the first part of the presentation, answering why we need the physics enhancing machine learning for SHM. And I hope that I convince you. Yes, please. Is, is SHM structural health monitoring? Yes. Okay. Uh, apologies. I thought that I said at the very beginning, but I didn't probably. Structural health monitoring, yes. OK. Any other question? No? All right. 
That's not your job. And if they ask for wine, it's fine. Uh, what are the main strategy then? Then how do we tackle this? Okay, so let's start to think about how we can incorporate physics bias. I'm gonna break it down. So there are four parts. We can introduce data that actually contain the physics that we want to have represented. We can generate that synthetically or we can collect. Okay, that's the first bias. The second bias is an inductive bias. We want to change the architecture of the algorithm. And we want to include conservation law of things that we know physically should be there for a reason. We might want actually to change also the way in which the learning of the data driven model part is actually happening. So what is the loss function, for instance? How do we select it? And also, we can have physics bias in terms of model form or discrepancy. We know part of the solution. We don't know a part. But the part that we know, we can still use finite element. We can still use our model. And we want to rely on that and learn the part that we don't know. And the thing is that we can combine all of this. And if we combine all of them, we will be able to accelerate training and enhance generalization. OK, so if this makes sense, I'm going to try to then explain to you some of the ways in which we can embed this. So usually, one of the easiest ways to visualize this is to use neural network. So if you've never seen a neural network in your life, that's totally fine. I'll walk you through. So let's imagine that you have some input layers. Uh, there are the things that are visible. Those are the data that you're giving us input to your model. And those nodes uh, and the number of those nodes depend on how many information you have at the very beginning. OK? So those are the yellow and green data. Then you have an output layer. There is just one output, a response that you would like to predict. So you want to create a mapping from the input to the output. And what you have in between are these hidden layers. So you have these neurons that are all connected. And the goal is to actually find the weights so that you understand how each neuron and how each activation function and how each part is actually contributing to the overall response. OK? So we want to go from the input to the output. But we want to use this actually to discover or to understand better a partial differential equation. And we can assume that we have a partially known differential equation in which there are some terms that we don't know. And what we can do is to say, OK, is the loss that this model, the total model at the end, will give you compared to the output layer going to be below a certain threshold? If it is, then actually I'm probably very good at having something that represents the reality. If it is not, then I'll go back and I might change this input layer, the information, or I actually retrain my neural network. OK? Does this make sense to you guys? Nice. OK. So which biases did we put in? We could adapt uh, more physics information as observation in the input layer. That's the layer that we see, the information that we give. Great. We could have put inductive bias in the way the neural network architecture was chosen. If our inputs were images, for instance, we could have chosen a convolutional neural network. Okay? We have learning biases in the way which might choose the loss function here, or the way we might apply some constraints. And finally, we may have this discrepancy bias because we say we knew actually about the governing question. Okay, so all of them together in a neat slide, I hope that looks a lot now, but hopefully because we build it up little by little, makes sense. So far so good? Yes, nice. Okay, so this is just one way of doing it, and it's not all pins, physics, and form neural networks. It's actually, there are other ways of doing it. And then another example is using probabilistic machine learning. And then we can have a physics bias and uncertainty that we can have. And the main goal is to correctly quantify uncertainties in the parameters or in terms of the model. So we have a model and we have some uncertainties. So we start basically from the fact that we might know a physics-based model and uh, we have some uncertainties. And we have uh, maybe a model form bias. So what we do is that then we collect some measurements and we can apply a learning algorithm. In this case, would be measure inference. And what we will get out of it is actually the quantification of these uncertainties. So how does it work? How it is different from what I was describing earlier? So this framework is accounting for different levels of information. One is the prior knowledge. What do you know before about something that cannot be directly measured? It cannot be directly observed. 
And that's the parameter, for instance, young models in operating of, uh, of your bridge in operating condition. And that's something that you would like actually to predict. So it's latent because you cannot directly observe it, but you have a guess about what it would be. And then there is the light group. The light group is telling you, okay, I'm going to take the fact that I have a physics model and I have some measurements and I look at the discrepancy between the two. And by looking at the discrepancy, I'm going to build the, the light group function such that I will get the posterior. There is the final distribution of the parameters that we don't know. Okay, this was now a crash course into Bayesian inference. Does it make sense so far, guys? Yeah, great. Okay, there is also another way, and this is gonna be the last way because there are so many, but I'm gonna observe this three, in uh, which you can actually add this physics information. And this is a general discrepancy learning scheme. What you would like to do at the end of it is again, quantify the uncertainties in the parameters, but you have a partially known physics model. Before we knew the physics model, Okay, so we know the pieces that we wanted to update the parameters. Now we say we know partially it, and there's a part that we don't know, and we want to learn. And what we can do is to start from this partially known model and collect data and apply a learning algorithm. And one example that is very easy to visualize is an example in which we have some regarding the question of the problem. You have something that you don't know and something that you know that is part of the equation. And you can tackle this by using approaches like also process learning force model or other techniques. And here there are some references, uh, like very general to look at. Okay, so as I told you, there will be many more, and I just spent that we all afternoon telling you about each of them. I'm not gonna do that as well. And uh, but the question that remains, which is the best one, which is the one that we should always use? Well. As everything in life, there is not a one size fits all. And actually, it really depends on the complexity of the system, on the amount of informative data, how much information they carry, and the purpose of that analysis. Okay, so that concludes the second part. Any questions so far? No? In, in the room, you're all with me yet. This is amazing. Great audience. So now I'm going to tell you about uh, some of the work that was done in the data regression and uncertainty group and was carried out and led actually by the, these people. Jan, that is here, Joanna, Luca, Christos, and Francesca. And I'm going to basically tell you which was the challenge and how we tackled the challenge. Okay. So challenge one, young spot, uh, is uh, our interest in looking at measurements that might have some spatial and temporal correlation. So we have, uh, in this case, a YASL bridge, and uh, it's a twin gear the steel road bridge. And what we had were these uh, strain gauges, so, and we were measuring uh, all of those points that are listed there. Now, if we want to apply a Bayesian interest scheme, a probabilistic machine learning, we will normally say, great, I have all of these data, they are all IID, independent, uh, statistically independent, and identically distributed. And I'm going to use all of them as if they were collected all at the same time, all at the same point, for getting a post-patient distribution. Well, if you do that, that posterior distribution of your parameter of interest, of what you didn't observe, might be actually significantly affected, might be very different. So what we wanted to do was accounting for this, basically, from this correlation. So. What is interesting, one way to see that, uh, and it's very, this is very intuitive, and it's a very nice way that John came up with to actually say how this correlation is affected. Imagine that you have sensors that are very far apart from each other. These are gener synthetic generated data. You don't see much structure, but as soon as they come together, what you see is that uh, they start being correlated, heavily correlated. And this is because uh, to the point in which the two sensors are one on top of each other, you will be measuring exactly the same thing. Okay, so what this is telling us is that distance is actually an information that we should keep in mind. Okay, now what we wanted to investigate is uh, the model correlation in the model prediction error and the system identification. Because if we account for this correlation, computation and this become very, very difficult to solve. So what we did there was looking at uh, a non physics based model. We can build a model of the twin gear the bridge of the Yasser bridge. And uh, we may have a large number of noisy measurements collected at different locations. 
And what we do is that we create an inductive bias. We basically select a pool of candidate models that represent uh, this spatial correlation. And to achieve this and to actually make the calculation feasible, because otherwise it will not be possible to run all of these analysis, Jan has developed this efficient calculation of the log likelihood for large data set. And this can be used uh, when you have uh, multiplicative or additive uncertainty model. And these are the steps. So you start with a candidate pool of this spatial correlation of this relationship. You have a physics model of uh, the bridge in this case. There is a twin builder, so you see two things that are connected. And basically, we go down from the data generating process, the likelihood, posterior distribution. And to do that, then have a posterior predictive use, a standard technique, nested sampling. So this was very interesting, uh, very useful, and showed us. Uh, the very importance to have to account for spatial and temporal correlation, but it's still making some uh, Gaussian error model assumption. And uh, to go further, there's still some work to do, but it was very exciting to see the impact already of making that kind of step forward in the challenge that we are having every day. Okay, so this is challenge one, solution one. Question for this? Yes. Can we explain X and a plus model prediction error? Yeah, so the X, uh, this is multiplicative and additive. Uh, that was the reason why I put an X and a plus. Yeah. Any other question? No? Great. Okay, so yeah, it's here. So what? Then uh, let's move to the second challenge. The second challenge is about wind turbines. So we were looking at wind turbines, and this work was led by Joanna, Joanna too. And I was done in collaboration actually led by Edith Marie Lawrence at TU Dallas. And I was very lucky to work with both of them. And I'm also very lucky to work with Jan, by the way. <laughs> so, what are the challenges here? If we consider the wind turbine, we may have an high risk of a big failure that is caused by cyclic, cyclic and environmental and operational load. The main challenge there is that we may have a particular spot at this point. These are not very easy to monitor because it's below the mud line, there is water, and uh, we don't know exactly which are the loads. So those are all the challenges that we have to face. So what do we want to do? So in this case, we were super lucky because the Maria's Maria strong collaboration with Siemens, and they gave us uh, some data that is coming from the Western Mean Park in the Netherlands. So we have this data, and the data was collected across different operational states of the wind turbine. So we were able to even go across different operational areas of the wind turbine. And what we were able to do was actually developing a virtual sensing technique. So the idea here is this. We have, for this case, an aggregation data set that contains three accelerometer, but also semester gauges. Now, our goal is to say, starting from this information, would we be able to predict what is happening here? And for the first time, actually validate that we are able to predict. Virtual sensing means generating a model that combines physics and data, a physics and advanced machine learning model, that help us, at the end, predict where we don't observe. In this case, the goal was validation. So what we did was actually going through all of these steps and uh, from the measurement data, there is the system identification, a latent force model, model tuning, and joining to state estimation. And what you can see here are the results. So the results are referring to S2, so it's the strain gauge number two at the bottom, the green line. And uh, this is during the production phase of the new one. And uh, what you see here are two colors, the black and the orange, the true and the estimated. The orange is the estimated. And this is in time, again, time domain strain prediction, but this is also in frequency, the power spectral density. And you can see that we are able actually to predict with this model that combines again the physics because we are having a numerical model of our structure with, uh, and actually it's a Timoshenko beam with some springs at the end, as you can imagine. And then uh, we are able to combine this information uh, basically with the data measurements and to use it for virtual sensing and validating. Okay, that concludes challenge two. Question. I'm doing great today. Oh. How much data do you need in order to produce something? 
that value. Yeah, so in this case, uh, so this is not a neural network powered, so it's not as that uh, angry as a neural network would be. We still needed to observe the behavior in different uh, operating states, and we still needed to make some assumption about it, uh, but not that much data. At the end, we had a large data set and we ended up decimating it uh, to, uh, I would say, not even more than 50 measurements, actually. Well, yeah. And uh, so what are the great things that we did? So everything looks great and it's amazing, but we didn't consider non-linearity. We assumed everything was linear and we assumed that the model structure was uh, linear time variant. So the wind turbine was not changing. There was no damage, there was no strain. What we were monitoring was just uh, the strain. Again, this is a big step towards going, you know, towards the most complex stuff, but still, you know, there is a lot to do. Okay, then challenge three, identification of non-linearity. Friction is one of the most important things because it's always there in structures. Because basically it's the force that is resisting the relative motion, the relative motional surfaces that are in contact to each other. Every joint has friction, pretty much. And why we use friction is because uh, it's very good at dissipating energy and reducing vibrational amplitude. But uh, on the other side, it actually created a problem like where noise, and we may have also large oxidation, and what is called stick slip. If you haven't ever seen stick slip, I'm gonna show you a video in a second. All of these things basically can reduce the remaining useful life of our structure and cause sudden failure. So it's very important to be able to actually identify friction. Most of the time, we cannot really measure friction because if the friction is something that is in between in a joint, I cannot open the joint and measure it. And if I put a sensor in between, then I change the joint. So that's the real challenge. That's why we need again to combine physics with data and with knowledge. So what did we do? So to explain this, I can go very big with a complex structure, but then there will be so many effects. So what we developed, and this is actually Luca Merino, uh, developed this test setup. This test setup is a very simple setup that at the end meaning that we have a single degrees of freedom in which we can actually create, uh, you can see the top figure number seven for the people online because I'm waiting to make the dots in. But at the top, you have this counterweight system in which a disc is in contact with the top plane. That's generating the friction. There is then a motor here that will make this base plate move in this direction. And because of, of these uh, stencils here, the top plate will move and we move in this direction. Because of the content, you will have friction, okay? So now, we are not gonna measure friction there, we're just gonna measure the response, the fact that this thing is gonna be moving up and down, okay? Or left and right, to be precise. So, let's see a video of this to show you what I mean. So, you can have a continuous motion, but by changing the normal force, so by changing the weight position, you must have seen what is called a two-stop stick slip. What it means is that in a cycle of the base, you might do move, stop, move, stop, move, stop. And uh, with this type of setup, we can go even to up to 12 stop, uh, stick, sleep, basically. And this is very interesting because this helps us uh, having a, a test setup that we can control that can, we can use to investigate the, this type of problem. Sorry, that's something else that was done. Okay, so how do we handle this? And this work again was led by Luca Marino that now is a uh, postdoc field out. So what we developed is uh, a technique that is a switching out some process latent force model. And uh, how does it work? So the idea is this. Our experimental setup is quite simple. It can be modeled as a single degree of freedom. The only thing that we don't know is the friction, okay? The friction force. So we can write the problem as uh, a single degree of freedom equation and uh, double dot, uh, plus C Z dot plus KZ, which means mass, dumping, stiffness, plus something functional form that we don't know. And then we know also the input because we can measure that as well. What we can do is we use what is called a Gaussian process to actually approximate what we don't know. Now, the type of problem that we discovered and the type of solution that uh, we use was considering we have a physics model that is partially known because we don't know this F function. We have some noisy dynamics response measurements, the displacement of the top mass, but also of the base. 
and, uh, and in fact, we have the input measurement. And what we know is also the physics. We know that there will be six sleep, or there might be six sleep, which means that our system will be in three states. And these states are the following. It might be sliding, it might be sticking, or we might need to have a set model because we want to account for the discontinuities in this force, because this friction force will have a discontinuity. Now, what it means is that we are introducing different biases, going back of how we introduce machine learning and physics bias, in terms of discrepancy, inductive and learning bias. And what was very nice is was to show, actually, I'm going to show you the experimental validation of this. We were able, to, so we starting from displacement measurement, to predict velocity and acceleration. And what you can see early are that there are uncertainty bounds. So we are not just predicting that, how the acceleration, the velocity is evolved with time, but we are also quantifying the uncertainties. We are able to actually predict the friction force evolution. And what this graph at the bottom show is the model. One of these three models that continues sliding, sticking, or reset model in which the system was. And again, we are able to predict pretty accurately as well when there was a stop and we have this very sharp edge. With normal Gaussian process like the force model, you will not be able to do it. That's why we needed the switching one. There was automatically switching using a Markov model. And what you see here are the results in terms of the friction force versus velocity. And what we are able to do is actually to characterize even the sharp edges. And we were able to do it also for different level of forces. OK, so this was challenge three and the solution. We wanted to identify the friction force without actually looking at the friction force inside. Question for this? Yes, please. Uh, I'm wondering how do you define the transformation matrix from one state to another state? Yeah, so for that, there is a Markov model I see that we are building. So it's a probabilistic model yeah. that is looking at the probability of a state to occur. So automatically then is deciding if she's going that state or not in the state. But I can point you, I mean, in, in this there will be in this publication, there will be all the details for that. But we can talk about it later as well. Yeah, in more detail, probably it's easy. Okay. Any other question? No? Okay. This was great, but now you get the catch. Every time I'm telling you this is great, there is always there's still work to do. And uh, this worked uh, for uh, this discontinuous non-linearity of friction. And uh, because we were also embedding the information that we knew about, C, about friction, but uh, we are using a Gaussian process. So there are dimensionality issues and we have to cover those. Okay, challenge number four. What were we interested in? We are interested in the friction law identification in region of the response in which is difficult to identify. So let me explain this. Let's imagine again that we have a single degrees of freedom, but we have two friction loads. There are different. One is Coulomb and the other one is a rated state. I cannot pronounce the name, so it's the DR load. Great. So if we look at the DR parameter space in terms of VA, and um, it doesn't matter that much, but if we look at the parameter space, depending on where you are, you may have Coulomb and this uh, uh, law, this red cell law, giving you exactly the same response in terms of the mass displacement versus uh, the forcing. Okay? But there might be other region, like the top left, in which are very different. So if your system is operating in this region, then it's very easy to say, okay, no, it's this law and the other. Most of the time, though, we cannot control in which region we are operating. So being able to understand if we can distinguish those is extremely important. So we took the challenge to say, okay, we are there. The response is indistinguishable. Can we actually go back and figure out what is the actual law? So the solution to this challenge was developed by Christos Lauder-Cardis. There was a research assistant with me and now works at TNO. And uh, this technique um, is called the physics and unsparse sparse identification. And it works like this. So you have some governing equation and you have a discrepancy bias because you know part of the equation, but you have something that you don't know. Now, the trick is how we trick this part that we don't know. And what we want to do is to say, we have very limited number of measurements. We have just one measurement. We don't have, we don't have lots of data set. 
And what we want to get out of this is an approximation of the unknown functional relationship. And the way in which this works is the following. We want to say that this function that we don't know is the product of two functions, basically. One is a library of candidate function, this theta, and the user chooses it. And the other one are actually this sparse coefficient psi period. Then we want to say if we have some physical constraints, we have some knowledge. Again, this is a friction problem, so we may we know that there might be six slip. We want to include that. And we want to include that in a Runge Gutta scheme. Runge Gutta is the integration scheme. Yes, and we are actually using Runge Gutta with a machine learning algorithm. This was actually already developed before, but we are learning and we are actually uh, trying to embed everything that we know from the physics within this algorithm. So we have something that constrains the physics, not only in terms of physics knowledge that we have, but also in terms of numerical solution. And what I mean numerical in this case is the difference between what our model will give us with respect to measurement. And uh, this is all a learning bias. Bias. So what happened is that with just one set of measurements, we are able with this bias eating to go back and determine the governing equation for multi degrees of freedom and multiple nonlinearities. And uh, let's see the case study because I was saying this is the challenge. And what we did was generating, actually, in this case, synthetically, a ground through equation. And we wanted to recover, basically, the behavior just from the measurements mm -hmm. and from, mm -hmm. say, that these are the dictionary of candidate function. And we were able to get uh, very, very good results. And also, we say, wait a second, it's actually the ready state model. So it's this one, the ground truth. We're generating data with noisy data. And uh, even though we are killing exactly everything as it was before, we are able to then retrieve the correct governing equation. So we are able basically to identify the correct vision law, and we are able to, we are still not able to accept to quantify the uncertainties. And that's what we are working on. We were able to identify the things that we didn't know, but not quantify the uncertainties in it. Okay, so this was the end of cha uh, challenge four. There is the last challenge of being, there is challenge five. It's going to be much lighter than this. There is no equation as well. So do you have any question on this one? No? Okay. Sorry. Yes, um, please. Have you tested the robustity of the master to the noisy data? Yes. So we did it also with experiments uh, as well. There was no time to show it. And okay. we used different level of noise. So very, very noisy data as well. And uh, but I, I can point you out to the publication as well so that... Uh, and the fraction node can also be identified correctly. So in uh, some cases, yes. In these cases, we didn't try the fractional one. So uh, okay. in principle, yes. Cindy itself uh, can do it. The RK port version can do it. Uh, but we haven't tested for this specific, specific learning framework. Thank you. Then challenge number five. We have a big problem, another big problem, such as health monitoring, and is distinguishing uh, between sudden fast firing damage versus staging damage. And Francesca came up with very, this very, very usual way of saying that each other was brilliant. Uh, so Francesca Marapini is the one leading this project and is a great collaborative project uh, with these fantastic people in which we are basically able to look at the medical benchmark and real case studies of different types, not only in terms of you know, the fact that uh, there are different material involved, but also of different type of loading and different time scale that we're interested in. And their interest there is how we look into the fact that we have a time varying phenomena and because we will have aging and this failure, and we want to distinguish between this slow progressive trend and this fast sudden shift. And what Francesca is developing is this physics enhanced machine learning architecture to basically leverage of what we know from physics and map the data also to a lower latent space to actually extract information that we need. Okay, from this part, I'm not going to tell you anything because you were staying with me for all of this time and it was great. But then I, I guess that I should conclude and telling you about which are still the remaining challenges. You see already that there are a lot. And uh, one of the challenges that we have always to remember is that we are dealing with data that can embed bias. The data can be noisy, but can be also not complete or corrupted. 
And what it means is that uh, we have challenges and opportunities removing uh, inappropriate data bias, bias, but also uh, looking at way to assess the quality of the data. If we think about uh, physics, uh, basically what we are saying is that every time we have the physics model information, we are constraining uh, the domain. So if we look at our solution space represented in 2D for simplicity, what it means is that we are basically saying, although the solution space is this big, because we are constrained with physics, we should look here. Now, the solution uh, that is approximately we will get minus D can be there, but maybe the correct solution was somewhere else. Because we are basically constraining with physics to look somewhere only. What it means is that there are challenges and opportunities in improving our physics model, but also in understanding where is the physics bias and detecting it and removing it. But there are many more other technical challenges. I'm gonna list all of them, but it goes from where to measure, what and when. And of course, this is my bias view. Every time you see the symbol, it was because it was my honest bias view on the topic. But there are many others, and actually even more than I can think of. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and to thank also uh, the different founders that supported this, but of course, all the people that have been involved uh, with this research. Of course, it's not just me. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you.